Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 1, Tutorial 16b on Inventory Costing Methods. This is the second of three tutorials related to inventory costing methods. In this tutorial, we will review the Weighted Average Perpetual Approach. It is recommended that you review Tutorial 16a, where we covered the Weighted Average Periodic Approach before proceeding with this tutorial. We have one learning objective for this tutorial and that is to determine the ending inventory and cost of goods sold under the weighted average perpetual approach. This tutorial continues with the Newman Valve Company example, so again, please make sure that you have the correct file and that you have previewed the information before proceeding. Our requirement is to calculate the ending inventory and cost of goods sold for the month of August, assuming the company uses weighted average perpetual inventory costing. Now this method is a little more complex than the previous method, so that's why it's suggested that you preview tutorial 16a on periodic first and then this one because this one just has a lot more work involved. We always begin with our beginning inventory. So August 1st, we had 500 units in inventory at a cost of $15 for a total of 7,500. Now this first piece doesn't change from tutorial 16a, but the rest will as you will see. Immediately, our next transaction is a sale. So on August the 5th, we sell 200 units at a cost of $15 because that is the average cost that's sitting in our ending inventory at the beginning of the period. To determine the cost of goods sold on that, $15 times 200 is a cost of goods of 3,000. That leaves us 300 units in inventory, 500 minus the 200 sold. And if we multiply that by $15 average cost, we end up with $4,500 remaining inventory at this point. What you'll notice here and with subsequent sales is that the weighted average cost never changes after a sale. Then on August the 10th, we have our first purchase, this time of 250 units. At a cost of $17 is $4,250 cost. The balance in inventory now is 550 units. We had the 300 beginning and we purchased another 250. That gives us 550 units. Now here's where things change a little bit. We just can't multiply by something like we did here with the $15 to get what our ending inventory is or the same with the beginning inventory because we've made a purchase that is at a different price than our beginning inventory. So what we must do is head over here. I'll do this in purple. Head over here first and say, okay, I'm going to take $4,500 that was the balance in inventory after the most recent transaction, which was a sale. And then I add to that the 4,250 cost of the purchase. So now the dollar value of my inventory is $8,750. Now that I've determined that my total inventory balance is $8,750 and that I have 550 units, here is where I determine what the average cost is. I have to take my 8,750 and divide by the number of units. So my average cost now is $15.91. And this makes sense because my beginning inventory was valued at $15, but then I made a purchase at $17. After making the purchase, the average value of my inventory must increase if the price increases. And if this were purchased at, let's say, $14 or $13, then the average cost would decrease. It would be below $15. The thing to notice here is that whereas with a sale, the average cost never changes, when we have a purchase, the average cost always changes. We illustrate this again with another purchase on August the 25th purchased 100 units at a cost of $20. That gives us $2,000 in cost for a total of 650 units. So the 550 plus the additional 100 units. And that gives us a total now of 10,750 in inventory because we begin with our 8,750 after the previous purchase. And then we add the $2,000 of this purchase, giving us a total inventory value of 10,750. Now, once again, we determine the average cost to this point, and that's our total cost after the second purchase of 10,750 in inventory divided by the 650 units in inventory. Now, our cost increases again 
to $16.54. And of course, this should make sense because the second purchase is higher than the average that we had previously and higher than the previous purchase. So as prices go up, as our cost increases, the average inventory value will go up. And then on August 30th, we have a sale, 450 units. And we calculate the cost of goods on that sale as 450 units times my average cost. The $16.54 average cost becomes the basis for calculating the cost of goods sold in this sale. And that was the same idea for the very first sale. We had an average cost of $15 that was based on the cost in inventory at that time. And the average cost was only based on the beginning inventory balance. So our balance at the end is 200 units, the 650 minus the 450, at an average cost, which doesn't change, of 1654 for a total of 3307. At this point, we can calculate what our total cost of goods is of both sales. We have our $3,000 cost of goods from the first sale, calculated at the 200 times the $15 plus the $7,443 from the second sale, giving us total cost of goods sold of $10,443. And if I want to check that my ending inventory is correct, I can prove it. I can take my $7,500 in beginning inventory and add the cost of the purchases. So this $250 times 17 was $4,250 on the first purchase then another $2,000 from the second purchase, and I subtract the cost of goods sold that was calculated right here, that gives me $3,307. And 1654 times 200 is $3,307. It may be off due to rounding, but otherwise we've proven that it works. The other thing to note here is that under the perpetual approach, we have multiple weighted average unit costs, whereas under the periodic approach, there was only one. We had a beginning rate of $15, and then after our first purchase, that increased because our first purchase was higher than the beginning average. And then our second purchase costs went up even more, raising our average cost further. So as you can see, the only time the cost changes is after a purchase. The cost stays the same after a sale. And now for some key points to remember. First, the weighted average perpetual approach computes multiple weighted average costs. And what happens is, as a result, the average unit cost of inventory will always change after a purchase. And of course, this presumes that the purchase price changes from the current average. If the purchase price doesn't change, then the average doesn't change. And then finally, the average unit cost of ending inventory will never change after a sale. Average costs only change on purchases or after purchases, but never after a sale. This concludes tutorial 16b and actually concludes all of the discussion related to the weighted average approach. You can now proceed to tutorial 16c, which focuses on the periodic and perpetual FIFO approaches.